Hello, welcome. I am Dr. Jorge Cerda, Chair of the ASNKI Now Initiative. Today, Dr. Sara Faubel, Professor of Medicine and Nephrology at the University of Colorado and I will have the pleasure to moderate this session of Kidney Week. We appreciate ASN's invitation to moderate this event and your attendance to this exciting session focusing on AKI in the COVID-19 pandemic. The AKI Now initiative sponsors this session. This is a novel ASN project which aims to promote excellence in the prevention and treatment of AKI by building a foundational program that transforms the delivery of AKI care, reduces morbidity and mortality, and improves long-term outcomes. As you may be aware, in collaboration with iCreon, we have developed a very innovative compendium accessible online to all ASN membership, which contains all the publications and educational materials generated by the society. We hope you will access it, use it, and make it your own. We will appreciate your feedback on how we can make it most useful to you. For this session, we have gathered an excellent faculty and other voices on the problem. On the first talk, Dr. Mitra Nadim, Professor of Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California, will discuss the highlights of the International Collaborative Acute Dialysis Quality Initiative on the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, Dr. Kathleen Liu, Professor of Medicine and Critical Care at UCSF, together with Kelly Timothy, a UCSF critical care nurse and an invited patient, will give us their perspective on AKI during the pandemic. Next, Dr. Dominic Santoriello, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Columbia University Pathology, will discuss the histopathology and pathogenesis of kidney injury in COVID-induced AKI. Finally, Professor Jay Coiner from the University of Chicago School of Medicine will discuss exciting perspectives on the use of artificial intelligence for early AKI detection and prognostication of outcome. During the session, we encourage you to ask questions and to participate. The session faculty, Professor Fabel and I, will endeavor to answer your questions in real time. At the end of the session, Professor Fawell will summarize the session conclusions and recommendations from all of us. We declare no conflict of interest for this educational activity. Thank you for joining us. Let us get the session started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Mitra Nadim from the University of Southern California. I'd like to thank the moderators for inviting me today to um, present the highlights of the 25th ATKI meeting on COVID-19 AKI. These are my disclosures. I'd like to also state that the ATKI uh, 25 meeting was held um, in mid-May till uh, mid-June. And some of the um, studies that I'm going to be showing you were published after um, our ATKI meeting. However, I felt it was important to show this data as it also supports our findings during the ATKI meeting. ATKI was founded in 2000 by Dr. John Kellum, Dr. Ravi Mehta, Dr. Claudia Ronco, and Dr. Ronaldo Balamo. It's a international interdisciplinary organization with over 150 members from leading universities around the world and includes adult and pediatric nephrologists, pharmacists, intensivists, and depending on the topic, cardiologists, surgeons, hepatologists, and radiologists. And the purpose of ATKI is to improve the care of patients with AKI through evidence-based medicine. And as you can see here over the last 20 years, ATKI has addressed many topics on AKI, especially um, with a focus in the field of critical care nephrology. ATKI 25 um, marked the uh, 20th anniversary of the uh, first ATKI and was also the first virtual ATKI that was organized. These are the organizers of ATKI 25. The conference was held virtually over four weeks with weekly virtual consensus meetings from May 23rd to June 13th, 2020. 
And as the ADKEY 25 faculty, the conference included a diverse panel of clinicians and researchers representing nephrology critical care from the Americas, Europe, and Asia to discuss the issues relating to AKI associated with COVID-19. And the core questions and statements were developed for each of these areas by the members of the work groups. There were five work groups. And this was then presented during four successive plenary sessions involving all ADKEY delegates for debate, discussion, suggested revisions, and final consensus. The first working group was tasked at looking at the um, epidemiology and diagnosis of COVID-19 AKI. AKI. If you look at the rates of COVID-19 um, AKI and the rates of renal replacement therapy, these are studies that were published um, by the end of June of this year. And these studies were from China. And you can see here that the rate of AKI was anywhere from 0% um, to as high as 11%. Uh, Higher rates were seen in the ICU at 23%. The renal replacement rates also were on the lower side, ranging anywhere between um, one, uh, less than 1% to as high as 9%. Higher rates were seen in the ICU. But what about the rest of the world outside of China? These are publications that uh, mainly in the US, and one is from the database from the UK. And you can see here the rates of AKI were much higher and these were based on AKI definition of KDGO mainly. You can see the rates were anywhere from 20% uh, to as high as 40% uh, uh, and higher 60 to 80% in the ICU. The renal replacement therapy also was higher rates compared to what was reported in China, and it was um, anywhere between 15 to 30% uh, have been reported. So how do we explain the variations in COVID-19 AKI rates? Well, there's differences between these studies and probably baseline characteristics, age, comorbidities, race, ethnicity, differences in the severity of illness in the ICU versus the general ward, whether they were intubated, prone position or not, vasopressor requirements, variation in definitions of AKI, timing of renal replacement therapy, mechanical ventilation, whether or not the patient was kept dry, use of nephrotoxic therapies, um, such as med, uh, various uh, medications or IV contrast. And what actually was reported could have um, resulted in this variation that is seen in the rates uh, reported in China compared to the rest of the world. This is a study that came out um, recently in JAMA. It's a multicenter trial in, on 65 hospitals across the U.S., over 2,000 patients um, admit to the ICU with COVID-19. And what they demonstrated was that there was a lot of um, inter-hospital variation in administration of medications and supportive therapy for treatment of COVID-19 and organ injury. And this variation could have been due to either variation resources that were available to each hospital, variation due to the fact that there was limited high-quality evidence on which to base clinical practice. There was uh, variation maybe in the availability of certain medication, and also potentially unmeasured variation in patient and practitioner characteristics across the centers. But what was also very interesting, which they found, was that patients who um, were in hospitals where there were less than 50 ICU beds had a higher risk of mortality compared to patients who were admitted to, IC, to hospitals with a higher number of ICU beds. This is um, also a study looking at all the publications that came out comparing the publications from uh, China versus um, publications from the US. And you can see here that the proportion of reported comorbidities um, that were reported in the U.S. studies were much higher than compared to China, and this could explain, again, potentially the difference in rates of AKI and renal replacement therapy that we've seen between studies coming out of China compared to the rest of the world. But if the definition of KDGO is used, the epidemiology of COVID-19 actually looks fairly similar to that of other forms of community-acquired pneumonia, and you can see here that um, the rate uh, is, has been reported about 30% in community-acquired pneumonia and very similar we see from the U.S. studies um, published on the AKI rates in patients with COVID-19.
So one of the other questions that was um, tackled in during the ACU was what are the risk factors for AKI with COVID-19 infection? Well, the risk factors, there's underlying demographic risk risk factors, older age, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiac disease, high BMI, there may be genetic factors. Then there are risk factors that occur during admission, the severity of the COVID-19, the degree of viremia, the respiratory status of the patient, other non-respiratory organ uh, uh, dysfunctions, uh, development of diarrhea, for example, markers of inflammation, hypovolemia and dehydration, and medication exposure. Then throughout the course of the hospitalization, there's also other risk factors of uh, receiving nephrotoxic agents, vasopressors, ventilation, um, uh, whether they receive a high PEEP, the, and the fluid dynamics, whether they're fluid overloaded or hypovolemic. And risk stratification is important to tailor monitoring and develop really prevention, early treatment strategies for patients who will benefit the most from intervention. And so a recommendation during the SATCI was that we suggest that information about all these risk factors to be obtained um, to define risk profiles of patients with COVID-19 AKI. What's emerging um, in several uh, studies is that uh, the presence of CKD is a key risk factor for COVID-19 mortality. This is a study from the UK. You can see over 17 million um, EMR uh, records were reviewed and it was linked to the 10,000 COVID-19 related deaths. And you can see here that the presence of underlying chronic kidney disease had a higher um, risk of mortality even higher than patients if they had underlying heart or lung disease. So what is the clinical course and prognosis of COVID-19 AKI? This is a study from Mount Sinai with close to 4,000 patients. The 30-day survival was around 45 percent and on the right you can see from those patients with AKI who did survive 64 percent had recovered renal function by the time of discharge and from the 35% who had non-recovery at the time of discharge, you can see here still about 18% had persistent um, stage 3 AKD on follow-up. And so it becomes important for these patients to be followed very closely once they are discharged. This is um, results from a, another um, ATKI meeting looking at quality improvement goals for AKI. And based on that, we recommended that Patients should be monitored for AKI throughout their hospital course, but more importantly, be followed for recovery post-discharge. And again, who follows these patients and the uh, timing of when these patients get followed up or what tests are necessary would depend on the severity of their um, AKI, not only during hospitalization, but at the time of discharge. Group two, they were tasked with looking at the pathophysiology of COVID-19 AKI. So what are the direct and indirect pathogenic mechanisms that have been implicated in COVID-19 AKI? Well, the exact pathophysiology right now has not been clearly elucidated. It's probably multifactorial. On the left here, you can see there's possibly direct viral effects that can lead to, lead to um, either... Um, direct uh, glomerular disease, collapsing glomerulopathy, or it can lead to severe systemic inflammatory response and microvascular thrombosis. Um, you can see the, that COVID-19, we all know, can cause endothelial dysfunction as characterized by the high D-dimer levels and microvascular damages. And this could be, again, a uh, key factor in the development of COVID-19 associated AKI. Also COVID-19, um, the, the, excuse me, SARS-CoV-2 virus is associated with activation of an inflammatory response that has been termed by many as a cytokine st storm, and this could potentially contribute to the pathogenesis of COVID-19 associated multi-organ dysfunction. In addition to the direct pathophysiology, um, direct viral effect, there's also indirect effects and this could um, be what we see in any patient with any kind of critical illness. For example, you can have insensible fluid losses from the fever and diarrhea. This leads to hypovolemia and, and acute tubular necrosis. Um, there could be organ crosstalk. These patients develop uh, significant uh, lung disease. They can have um, 
a cardiomyopathy leading, uh, leading to a cardiorenal syndrome or a, a lung kidney um, interaction. Um, and then again, the fluid ma uh, management, the mechanical ventilation, the need for mechanical ventilation, proning, and the nephrotoxins can all lead again to um, acute kidney injury in these patients. The third group was tasked with looking at the prevention and management of acute kidney injury. And so the question they um, posed was, what standard of care strategies are applicable to the prevention and management of AKM patients with COVID-19? Many of you are familiar with this diagram. It is very similar to what um, the KDGO has uh, published in management of patients with AKI. As I just discussed, the pathogenesis of AKI is likely involves there's direct viral effects, there's indirect effects, and there's sequelae from the clinical, uh, from the disease management. And all of these can lead to um, development of AKI at any time during their hospitalization. And currently, there's no specific evidence um, that is available to us to suggest that COVID-19 AKI should be managed differently from other causes of AKI in critically ill patients. And there are indeed few recommendations for AKI are really etiology specific. So most of the measures um, recommended by KDGO and other relevant guidelines are appropriate for patients with COVID-19. And so that was our recommendations for ATKI that they should be treated with the KDGO-based standard of care. What about fluid management in these patients? Well, we have to be very cautious. Um, there's a balance between the uh, kidney where aggressive diuresis can lead to AKI. And on the other side is the heart and the lung where aggressive fluid resuscitation could lead to um, worsening lung injury and um, heart failure. And so the recommendation was that we need to individualize the fluid and hemodynamic management based on the dynamic assessment of the cardiovascular status of these critically ill patients. And our recommendation was to use balanced crystalloids as initial management for um, fluid resuscitation in these patients who are at risk of AKI or with AKI unless there's a specific indication uh, for the use of other fluids for um, the patient. The fourth group was tasked at looking at renal replacement therapy in patients with COVID-19 AKI. Prior to the start of this um, ATKI meeting, we did a survey of all the uh, participants. There was about um, 35 participants. And the questions were asked specifically regarding to the renal replacement therapy. First question was asked what indications these physicians use as primary reasons to commence acute RRT in the ICU. And you can see here on the top, before COVID-19, um, most of us were uh, starting renal replacement therapy when patients had evidence of uh, fluid overload um, or patients were anuric. Very few um, uh, were using it as sepsis and cytokine storm. During COVID-19 AKI, still fluid overload was considered a um, main cause, but you can see here it dropped from before COVID-19, suggesting that people were using more diuretics at this time. Um, hyperkalemia now became a main issue of starting uh, renal replacement therapy. And there was some trickling in of um, people starting renal replacement therapy because of cytokine storm. Then we were asked if we used intermittent IC, um, hemodialysis in the ICU. And you can see here, prior to COVID-19, most of us um, did not use intermittent hemodialysis in the ICU. But with during the peak of COVID-19, you can see here there was now starting to be a transition with um, more people using intermittent hemodialysis. What about PERT? Um, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy in the ICU. Again, um, prior to COVID-19, um, the majority either didn't use it or for less than 25%, but you can see here during the peak of COVID, there was a change and people were starting to use this as a modality in the ICU. What was the preferred 
anticoagulation, again, before COVID-19, you can see here for CRT, the majority used um, citrate, but there were centers that, um, including my own, that we don't use any kind of anticoagulation. For intermittent dialysis or PERT, again, the majority were not using any um, anticoagulation. But this drastically changed during COVID-19. You can see here that although some centers kept the citrate, the numbers dropped. But now you can see the use of more systemic um, heparin use in patients on CRT and definitely systemic hep um, heparin for anticoagulation for um, patients who are intermittent and um, PERT. And the filter life also changed, as you can see here, prior to COVID-19. Um, those centers, especially those using anticoagulation, you can see here they were able to keep a, um, the filter lifespan was over 48 hours. Then during early on in the COVID-19, this significantly dropped with now the filter lifespan being less than six hours. And as time passed and um, centers started to use different strategies for anticoagulation, you can see here then again there's an um, increase now in filter lifespan as we have learned more about this um, disease. So the questions that we're asked in this group is, if there are adequate renal replacement resources, are there patient-specific considerations with respect to vascular access, timing, modality, dose of acute RRT for patients with COVID-19 AKI? And really, there aren't that many um, differences from patients who have AKI in the ICU. And so our recommendation for timing of renal replacement therapy, vascular access modality, really uh, should be based on patient needs, the expertise, the availability of staff and equipment. Um, there's been several randomized um, trials that really have demonstrated no difference in mortality or renal recovery with um, initiation of renal replacement therapy in the absence of emergent indication. And so in patients with COVID-19 AKI, they should, uh, the initiation should be individualized and clinical context should be considered, again, whether it's for volume management in someone who's severely hypoxic. The prone position, obesity, and hypercoagulability may affect the vascular access performance. Um, we recommend renal replacement dose therapy again, be based on the KDGO AKI guidelines, but to consider the fact that there could be interruptions in the more prolonged um, sessions due to circuit clotting, due to the hypercoagulable state, and therefore may need to adjust this to account for this disruption. And since COVID-19, again, induces this hypercoagulable state, if using CRT, we um, suggested use of CVVHD or CVHDF to decrease the filtration fraction and reduce the risk of circuit clotting. Many of you are aware of all the advantages and disadvantages um, of, of these various modalities, but more importantly in COVID-19 AKI, what were some of these? Well, with intermittent um, hemodialysis, the, one of the advantages, which was um, to many centers, this was very important, it allowed the treatment of several patients in a day with the same machine. And But the problem was that now you required a dialysis nurse to do to perform the dialysis and an IC nurse again potentially exposing um, and requiring more personnel to do this, and it was difficult. Many of these patients received a lot of fluids, and so to keep a negative balance was difficult. For CRT, it was easier to reach reach that um, negative fluid balance, and it was um, in these patients who, if they were unstable, it was better tolerated. The problem now was that um, the clotting led to lower de uh, delivered um, dose, inability to achieve uh, fluid balance, and more importantly, it was an increase in resource utilization. It also required one machine per patient per day, and again, depending on the resources, this became very difficult. PERT, uh, whether it was with an intermittent dialysis or CRT machine, it again allowed treatment of several patients. Um, hope There was some uh, lesser incidence of clotting, because of the higher blood flow. But again, there was challenges and uncertainty of the drug dosing, and it wasn't available for everyone. 
peritoneal dialysis became a consideration in some centers, in, um, especially in New York, with high volumes, and also in, in the rest of the world where there was uh, not enough um, dialysis, hemodialysis machines. And again, th there's no concerns of circuit clogging, but the problem was that many centers, especially in the U.S., did not have policies or protocols um, in place for QPD, and so that became um, difficult also if the patient was in a prone position. But the reality of COVID-19 started to hit the U.S. around um, April as it pertains to renal replacement therapy. We started having um, news um, newspapers um, writing articles about lack of dialysis machines in various centers. And as a physician, it became uh, very difficult in managing these patients because there was not only a shortage of uh, ventilators, now there was a shortage of, of dialysis machines. And physicians had to really uh, decide how these scarce resources were being used in their uh, facilities and to decide one by one on each patient individually um, who and when they should receive these um, uh, treatments to be able to um, save as many patients as they could um, during their um, crisis disease. So, but when we asked, um, again, the attendees, what logistic challenges did you encounter for renal replacement provision during, uh, during COVID-19? You can see here the um, lack of physicians was not the challenge. The biggest challenge was the lack of devices the consumables, the fluids, again, for CRT, a lot of um, centers were running out of solutions. And nursing became a, you can see here, a major challenge in many centers. What were the major patient challenges in providing high-quality um, RRT to COVID-19 patients in the ICU? And you can see here um, the major problem was the circuit loss and uh, circuit clotting, but also the bedside um, barriers was a problem for many of the individuals who responded to this um, uh, survey. And examples were, again, keeping the patient in the prone position, trying to deliver RRT, uh, the PPE and infection control all were considered barriers. So what are the key considerations when planning for a sudden surge in acute renal replacement demand? Our recommendation is really um, for the centers to consider adjustments to their RRT modality, their indication, anticoagulation, and dose as part of a local response to an imbalance in supply and our demand to conserve this really scarce resource and deliver the effective therapy to the greatest number of patients. So what does this mean in, in the uh, case of RT indications? Um, potentially consider judicious and safe use of IV bicarbonate, potassium binding resins, diuretics to forestall RT initiation. Um, as far as modality, the choice could, may be affected by the supply of you know, disposable materials, machine availability, availability of appropriately trained staff to operate machines and safely deliver RT, and if there's limited machine availability, maybe consider uh, shorter durations of intermittent hemodialysis or use of CRT machines for PERT, and that way you could use um, one machine for two or three patients. If IHD or CRT machines availability is uh, limited, to consider use of acute PD. Um, again, the uh, advantages of PERT or intermittent, as mentioned before, can include shorter duration of therapy session, and this will optimize uh, machine and human resources to increase the number of patients who can receive RT per day. Regarding the dose, um, could uh, we suggest consider using lower than usual flow rates once metabolic control is achieved, and if shorter durations of intermittent hemodialysis or CRT machine for PERT are prescribe, we recommend that appropriate adjustments could, should be made in fluid removal targets and RT dose to achieve appropriate fluid balance targets and metabolic control. Um, for example, uh, one could potentially increase the effluent dose to meet the demands and needs of the patient. Time. Final um, group was uh, on extracorporeal um, therapy. 
And the question was, what is the potential biological rationale for using non-renal um, extracorporeal blood purification in critically ill patients with COVID-19? You can see here with patients with um, COVID-19, they can either have uh, moderate or severe disease and multi-organ failure with a lot of um, the pathogens, as mentioned, could be the direct viral, it could be um, cytokines, um, PAMs, uh, uremic toxin. And the aim of this treatment of using um, extracorporeal uh, blood purification would be to prevent or mitigate organ uh, damage by removing you know, the virus and cytokines. Unfortunately, um, this for now has not been uh, proven, at least in COVID-19. And this was a nice editorial saying, is a cytokine storm relevant to COVID-19? And it looked at all the publications on COVID-19. And you can see here the IL-6 levels are significantly lower than studies that came out on ARDS, um, severe ARDS, you can see here. So it more it kind of looks more like a cytokine drizzle rather than a storm. And so our recommendation was there's no consensus exists on the use of thresholds of specific biological and clinical criteria for initiating, monitoring, or discontinuing um, these therapies in critically ill patients with COVID-19, and really more studies are necessary in this area. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to this session on COVID-19 related acute kidney injury, the voice of the patient and the family during the pandemic. I'm Kathleen Liu. I'm a nephrologist and intensivist at the University of California, San Francisco. And it's really my great pleasure to introduce uh, and honor to introduce uh, our speakers today. So first we have Linda and Ron Tempko. Uh, Ron was a patient of ours at UCSF. He was hospitalized for COVID-19 in mid-March, the start of the pandemic. And at the time of his hospitalization, Ron was 69, active and relatively healthy. He had recently returned from a trip to England and South Africa. Now I said Ron was 69, that's because Ron has recently turned 70. So happy birthday to Ron. Ron, ha Ron had a very prolonged hospitalization, but survived and is with us to talk to us about his experience along with his wife, Linda. He was at our medical center for 61 days on mechanical ventilation for 34 days. And he had dialysis requiring acute kidney injury, but recovered and came off dialysis prior to discharge. And due to our COVID-19 restrictions, uh, Ron's family was not able to visit with him in person at the hospital. I'd also like to introduce Jason Bloomer, uh, one of our outstanding uh, critical care nurses. Jason's originally from New Mexico and has been a critical care nurse for eight years. He's worked with us at UCSF for just over a year, and we're fortunate that he is one of our core MICU, SICU nurses. He's cared for Ron, and he cared for, has cared for many of our patients with COVID over the past several months. And Jason is currently obtaining a master's degree in health policy to better advocate for patients and bedside clinicians. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn and start asking our uh, speakers some questions. So Ron, uh, maybe I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what your first memory of being in the hospital was and what that was like? Yes, uh, I was put into a hospital room, a very large hospital room that had a panoramic view of the entire city. And I was on my cell phone with the family and I said, wow, this is like the Four Seasons here. You know, it was just beautiful. It was, a, a, you know, it, it was panoramic, the whole city. And then uh, I was there for a day or two. And the next thing I remember, I was being wheeled off into, uh, I, actually, I didn't know where I was going, but I guess I was going to the ICU or, uh, and uh, that's really the last memory I had of that room. And uh, until I woke up, I don't know how many days later, 40 days later, something like that. And what did you remember when you woke up at that time, 40 days later? Well, it was kind of scary. Um, my legs weighed a thousand pounds a piece. They were like two trunks of sequoia trees. Um, my left arm was completely paralyzed. My right arm was probably 30%. And... Um, it was scary because, you know, you just don't know if that's, I just didn't know if that was going to be the rest of my life, you know? And uh, so I went through some very uh, 
mental breakdowns, um, some suicidal, some uh, just just very very dark, a very dark period uh, for about uh, I think four or five days. And um, the psychiatrist came, the spiritualist guy came, and uh, finally. Um, Jason Knox and sends him to me and, and said, look, you're going to be fine in six months. And once I had, once I put that in my mind, that there was a, that there was a date and time that I, I could feel that, that, that I would be okay. I settled down and I kind of got out of this delirium in this, in this dark area. Well, that sounds really terrifying as an experience. Were there other things that helped uh, with the delirium? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, sleep, I suppose. I, I don't know what drugs I was given at the time, uh, but um, it, it wasn't like a 24-7 thing. I, I, I don't recall exactly. It, it, was, it was just a very dark period of, my, of, of being there and thinking awful thoughts and having dreams and bad dreams and what people were doing to me. And I was very paranoid, too. Um, I never, there, there was, for some times, I never even thought I was in the hospital. I thought I'd been taken to some tent someplace. And I actually had a, a watch band that I thought was converted to a catheter. I mean, it was crazy dreams and crazy thoughts that were going through my mind at the time. Um, but uh, in answer to your question, I don't know what helped or what didn't help. I probably was given some drugs or something like that. And it sounds like a, some good nursing, reassuring nursing was a big help to you. That's right. Uh, Linda, sort of at the same time, right? Ron was sick for a long time. What was it like to be, you know, married to Ron for 40 years and unable to be in the hospital seeing him? And how did you get information about what was going on with Ron? Well, it was very disheartening not being able to go and, and hold his hand and be there in the room with them. But luckily, um, Jason set up Zoom for us right away. And my family was very supportive to me. Everybody was in isolation since we had all been exposed to COVID. So having the Zoom where we could all come together and I, we were with him daily as a family. We would just, the, the nurses told us that he could hear us even though he didn't, you know, he was in a uh, induced coma. So we would sing to him. We would tell him stories. We'd pray with him. We had a thousand people all over the world praying for him. And so we'd read them blurbs that, you know, that they would, you know, send. And a couple of people actually came on the Zoom call and, and prayed with us or, or you know, um, said things to him. So the Zoom was um, really the most helpful tool that we had. And then um, the, the iPhone um, and FaceTime uh, also played a big part when um, Zoom had its restrictions with, parent, with patient privacy issues and things. So without those tools, I think, I don't know if we would have made it really. It's, it's really hard to, be, to stay connected um, during these, this time when we don't ha when we have all these restrictions, but it sounds like technology was really able to help you do those things. And Linda, maybe could, can you comment a little bit on how the, did the nurses have to help you set up the Zoom? How did, how did the Zoom? Yes, um, Jason was the first one to set up the Zoom. And um, he, uh, I learned how to do it from my end through Jason. And then after that, each, each nurse kind of had to learn because we were, were all new on this together. So sometimes it was challenging, you know, getting, getting it set up. And, you know, they, the nurses had to be available to monitor it. So um, that was challenging at times too. Um, so then when uh, they weren't available, that's when I would revert to my iPhone and especially when he was, was waking up and was in his ICU delirium, I was just a bee in his ear, you know, you're going to be okay, honey, you're going to be okay, this is temporary, <laughs> just a broken record so that he could constantly hear my voice and know that I was with him. And I think, right, that does make all the difference, right? We know that when people are waking up from that delirium, that familiar voice, that reassuring familiar voice is probably the most important, most grounding thing and something that's really hard to have 
during this challenging time, but it sounds like you were able to make that happen. How did you get home? But I think it was like he said, Jason, that he really believed <laughs> because, you know, of his position when he just said, hey, you know, this is going to be hard work, but you can do it. And then it kind of snapped out. <laughs> How about medical information, Linda? How did you get medical information from the doctors or did that information come from the nurses? What were those connections like for you? Um, the nurses would give me updates on his ventilator, what the, you know, the levels were and things like that. But uh, the, de the doctor would check in with me daily and sometimes I'd be freaked out and I'd be able to call the doctors, you know, because it was such a critical time. And, but they were, um, you know, they're very sobering at times. And at one point, the doctor asked me, you know, how long would it take to get you down here? Because I'll get you in. And I said, well, you're not going to call me unless you think you're going to lose them, right? And he said, well, that's right. And I said, well, you just keep him alive and I'm going to keep praying because he's not ready to go. <laughs> but we talk daily. Good. Okay, so you had a daily phone call with the doctors then uh, to get that medical information. Yes, and I had my notes and all my questions and I kept logging it as we went so I could monitor if he was going up or down or where the, the you know, the uh, levels were at. Yeah, you talked a little bit about your great family support from your children. Were you able to have some of those doctor's conferences with your family as well by Zoom or was everything pretty much by phone? Um, yes, we did have Zoom um, uh, encounters with the doctors, and my uh, son is, especially was very inquisitive and, um, you know, asked a lot of questions and was very comforting to know, you know, that there was somebody on top of him all the time and monitoring it every step of the way because we were, we were all learning together, you know, it was just so much unknown that we were just in uncharted waters. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're still in somewhat uncharted waters, it feels like. So Jason, I'm going to turn to you and ask you some questions. Can you share what's it been like to be a nurse during this time, right? You were a nurse for several years before this, before COVID came, and it obviously has probably changed your practice in some ways. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I have to say that was lacking was that family support. Um, it's not just to help reorient our patients and our family members to make sure that they know what's going on in that comforting face, but it's also, you know, somebody who's there who can alert the nurse normally when something's going wrong. Hey, his oxygen started dropping or something else that, you know, um, was there, but not having that support, I think, took a toll on Ron initially. Um, and it's on all patients because you're just, you know, your wife of 40 years isn't there to be there for you like she would have been able to have been you know months ago um and as far as practice goes it's you know very limiting being able to go in and out of the covid rooms with all the ppe and everything we're clustering as much possible care as possible um to limit how much exposure we have um which is very difficult you know nursing has a very strong belief in the power of touch and the healing touch uh and in interactions with patients so to take that portion of my practice away um was kind of impactful for me personally and made me feel like I was somewhat lacking as a provider because I wasn't able to provide that level of care that I had become so accustomed to being able to do. Um, and I'll, you know, echo what Ron and Linda said, Zoom was amazing. Uh, being able to let them see family members in the room, we'd move the computer over, let them see each other. And then I would come out of the room and sit at my nurse's station computer and zoom in and take everything off so they could see what I looked like and you know, be able to see my voice and, you know, really make sure everybody was getting updates and, you know, give them the opportunity to ask free questions. Uh, how can I support you? What What's not missing? You know, give my practical advice of, you know, logging what questions you have during the day. If you have any questions at night, write them down. That way tomorrow we can, you know, get these questions answered for you. Um, and then take the opportunity to, you know, bring in our physician and PT colleagues. We had several uh, physical therapists and respiratory therapists to join me on these calls outside the room to try and give updates from their perspectives. Because it's very difficult uh, for a while, we weren't even allowing the physical therapists in the room. So the nurses became the physical therapists um, to try and help out with their guidance. And it became very difficult. But, you know, as everything's progressed, we've kind of, 
smoothed everything out a little bit. We still got our wrinkles, um, but I'm very privileged and pleasure to have been able to do what I do. Uh, and especially to be able to be a part of Ron's uh, healing process. It made a big difference. Great. No, thanks, Jason. And and what what would you say your biggest learning lessons have been over the past few months? Not to put you on the spot, right? <laughs> how have you, how have you, I mean, right, you've learned from this experience in March of taking care of Ron and all of this. How, you know, what, how have you changed things that you do in your nursing practice now in October of 2020 because of all of the restrictions we still have for both our COVID and our non-COVID patients, right? We still have a very restrictive visitor policy right. for all of our patients. Um, I think I one of the big things for me personally has been the more uh, an in-depth appreciation of what it is I'm able to do. Um, I had it before. I love being a nurse. I, you know, was truly believe I was put on this earth to be a nurse. Um, but I think bringing those things and realizing how important they were when they weren't available and they weren't around and making sure that we're advocating to get as much time with our families and, you know, make sure there's an understanding of what's going on to make the transition for families easier. Um, with the one visitor policy right now, one person per day, you know, we, we've got to plan out in advance when Linda is going to be able to come in or the kids are coming in and how we're doing that. Um, so making sure to educate and really help navigate the healthcare system um, has been, you know, a step up for me to make sure my patients' families is, you know, as much as I'm caring for the patient at the bedside, uh, I truly believe their families are a part of that extended patient care. Um, and I treat them as patients of my own as well. So I want to make sure that they understand things. If they have that not moment where it's not clicking and you can kind of see that something's missing, I make sure to ask those harder questions and really push to ensure that there's an understanding and that they feel comfortable with plans and interventions that are going on. So I think bringing that family in more um, is, you know, one of the things that I feel like I do on a regular basis. We were doing it before, but I feel like it's more important now uh, to ensure everybody knows what's going on. Absolutely. It sounds like not only are you now an advocate for your patient, you're thinking about how to be an advocate for the family, right? So that the family can get the information that they need about what's going on with your patient, right? And Absolutely. allowing that family to, you know, for our non-COVID patients, have their one visitor per day for our COVID patients continuing with, unfortunately, the situation that Linda experienced where she wasn't able to come see Ron for a very extended period of time, but really kind of, uh, em, you know, embracing the concept that, you know, our patients are really in a family unit and we have to think about that family unit as well. Absolutely. Great. We actually had our 40th wedding anniversary on Zoom. <laughs> we did. Y'all did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's to the next one, not on Zoom. <laughs> right. Um, Ron, can you, can you share with us, what do you think the doctors and nurses could have done, you know, maybe better to help you during your recovery. It sounds like the nurses were fantastic bedside advocates, but are, you know, we all like to think about what we could do better. You know, I, I really don't have a lot of comment on that because um, I, I never saw any doctors, many doctors. Uh, and I, and as I, I was okay with it. They, they were on the computers, they were monitoring. You know, your, your department was monitoring me daily, if not hourly, and your department head called me and, and uh, as I told you before, he called me on Mother's Day and I told him, you're not being a very good son to call me on Mother's Day, but, uh, you know, I would say that the, the, that department was probably the most proactive, but I never really was in communication with a lot of doctors. Um, there was one doctor that came around um, <clears throat> Uh, in the evenings and just checked on me, uh, but I'm, I was okay with it. I, I had such unbelievable care from these nurses and uh, on it all the time I was given, uh, I really, as long, you know, I, I didn't have much connection with the doctors and I, I was okay with it. I remember one, the at, when he woke up though, one doctor that was very, um, influential in, in helping him you know off the the ventilator and she would she did her rounds daily right and she was the one that noticed that your left arm was not responding as quickly 
and was on top of that. And she would call me on, and then we find she would, they were going to trach them. And she was the one that said, no, I think we can get them off that ventilator without traking them. Um, so I remember her, yeah, but I was, I was, but he was still pretty I much out of it. it. But then once I got into, I was transferred over to Zion and, um, the, the floor doctor, Dr. Patel, I had, you know, that was a much more personal relationship. He made his rounds. He came by, he was a very uh, big, big advocate, you know, for what I needed. And, uh, but that I was, you, you were know, more alert. Yeah. I was uh, a human being at that point, you know, again. So, uh, but before that, I just, you know, uh, it was just too out of my control to even know what was going on. Really just had my faith, just kept my faith. So. Linda, do you think there are things that we could have done as a as an institution, either on the doctor side, the nurse side, to help your family deal with the stress of you, you know, not being able to come in? You know, I think the hospital did everything in their power that they could do. And um, as I mentioned, uh, our, our partner in Spokane did not have Zoom and the capability of having um, interaction with his his family and uh, our company, and we lost him. And I think a lot of it was because of not having that interaction. So I, I do believe that, you know, under the circumstances of not being able to have visitors come to the hospital, that UCS did a fabulous job. I'd like to go one step further that, you know, it was, it was new to these nurses, it was new to everyone, and everyone was proactive in getting this Zoom done. It wasn't like, oh God, it's a hassle because technology can be a hassle and, and not getting it right and get frustration. But every nurse was, we're gonna get this done. It was very proactive in, get, yeah. in making sure that we, they move it around, they get it done, they get it right and very proactive. And we had challenges. Sometimes we couldn't get the line working and you know, but- um, They tried everybody, everything they could. Everybody really pitched in and made it work. Great, well, that. We're, we're glad to hear that. Um, uh, you know, one thing we, you know, one, one line of uh, conversation that we didn't talk about earlier, Ron, were your kidneys and sort of your understanding of what happened to your kidneys and how much the doctors talked to you and to Linda about that part of your illness. Well, as I said, I think the most proactive doctor was, what was his doctor? Dr. Shu, our chief. <laughs> He was probably the most proactive doctor of all doctors. In fact, he was the really the only one. And he was, he must have Zoomed me every other day. Uh, I think he actually came into the hospital one or two days. But it seemed like, it seemed like I was his only patient. You know, he was just, you know, figuring out what was going on and was making decisions every day. He had dialysis, don't have dialysis. I think with the ultimate goal that I would go home without having dialysis. Yeah which happened. Yeah. yeah. The nurses were very informative to me. They kept me on top of what was going on with the dialysis on a daily basis. And that's why I knew that they were having trouble with the clotting and the machine, you know, not working and having to figure that out. And, you know, so I was pretty involved with um, the dialysis and we were all hopeful the whole time that his kidneys would kick back in when he got better and thank the Lord and thank the hospital that they did. But, you know, another thing too is, you know, uh, not having or, or having an advocate like Linda. I mean, I was no advocate for myself. There were times when I was depressed enough that I was, am I gonna make it through, you know? I'm not communicating with the doctors nurses more superficially, you know, what my immediate needs were. But I don't know how I would have survived this without having an advocate like Linda talking to doctors every day, being on top of it, and then talk, keeping me up and keeping me going. I mean, if I didn't have a family or I didn't have that, I, I'm not sure how this thing would have turned it's out. It's a full-time job, you know, it was my job. It was just my full-time job. <laughs> yeah, no, I think advocacy is really important and I think yeah and I think right looking for renal recovery when it's going to happen is really critical um, and knowing uh, to look out for that is really the key to getting people like you off dialysis so really mm -hmm. glad that uh, that was able to happen in the hospital for you. Well, that was one of the happiest yeah. moments because yeah. for me to have to leave I my my bedroom is three long flights up from the street <laughs> 
Can you imagine having to go di to dialysis and and uh, you know have to leave my apartment and it, it, it would have been a disaster. So, yeah. uh, but it was so wonderful when I got the news that I would not have dialysis after I left the hospital. Yeah, it's probably the best news we ever get. It's some of the best news we ever get to give patients as nephrologists. So, yeah, yeah. yes. Well, Jason, I want to ask you if you have anything else you want to add from your perspective as a nurse. Um, you know, just make sure anybody, patients, family, physicians, everybody together, that we just remember at the core that we're a team and we can't do it uh, without one another. And it's important that every piece of that cog is working, whether it's, you know, incorporating family via Zoom the best we can, or, you know, having somebody at the bedside. Um, I think truly working together in the interdis interdisciplinary teamwork that we had with Ron uh, made all the difference in the world. And I'm extremely proud to be a part of this team. So um, I'm happy to be here and I'm so glad every chance I get to see Ron since he's left the hospital uh, and hear how he's doing and updating. And I make him raise his arm every time uh, mm -hmm. just to see where we're going and how we're progressing. So That's it makes good. me very happy, happy and humbled uh, to be able to do this. And like I said, I'm very proud to be a member of the UCSF nursing team. So uh, we're doing great things and I continue to look forward to the greater things that are coming. Great. Well, I want to thank all three of you for participating today in this really, for me, what's been a very meaningful and moving conversation. Um, it's really, you know, Ron was one of our very earliest COVID-19 patients at UCSF, and it's really gratifying to see how far you've come on your road to recovery. Um, and we're looking forward to getting ongoing updates um, uh, on that recovery and the joyful um, family celebrations that you'll be having, uh, we hope, over the years to come. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you to UCSF yeah. for saving my life. <laughs> Great. Hello, my name is Dominic Santoriello. I'm a renal pathologist from Columbia University Medical Center in New York. I'd like to thank the moderators for inviting me to talk to you today about mechanistic insights of COVID-19 associated AKI uh, from our experience with kidney pathology findings. I have no disclosures. So I wanna start off by just giving some general statistics of COVID-19 associated AKI. Um, and as of the summer of 2020, there were already over 500 peer reviewed manuscripts uh, if you performed the search for COVID-19 outcomes and acute kidney injury. 20 of these had detailed data in regards to KDGO AKI staging, and these encompassed over 13,000 patients from three continents. So this is a pretty good cross-section that gives us the following information. The incidence of AKI is approximately 17% across these 20 studies. The majority of these patients with acute kidney injury had severe COVID-19 disease requiring ICU level care, 77%. Not surprisingly, the mortality rate was also high amongst these patients uh, with a rate of 52%. Uh, as such, it seems that acute kidney injury is a risk factor for increased risk of in-hospital mortality with an odds ratio of 15. Given the burden of acute kidney injury and COVID-19 disease, its negative prognostic implications, as well as the logistical challenges of managing acute kidney injury and during the surge of the pandemic, it was, it's important to begin to understand the potential mechanisms of COVID-19 associated AKI. As with most ICU patients, hemodynamic or ischemic concerns are uh, a potential major contributing factors. As it pertains to COVID-19, many of these patients in the ICU developed cytokine storm with the effects of distributive or septic shock, potentially contributing to kidney injury through those typical ICU mechanisms. There was also potential that aggressive fluid management was a contributing factor, particularly in patients with ARDS uh, undergoing ag aggressive fluid management in the setting of their lung disease. Another potential issue was myocardial dysfunction. Many patients were observed to develop troponin leaks in the setting of COVID-19 disease, and there was even some early evidence of possible viral myocarditis induced by COVID-19. And lastly, hypoxia in the setting of ARDS may have contributed through an ischemic mechanism. In terms of potential toxic tubular insults, one of the earliest concerns was the possibility of direct viral infection of the kidney with viremia leading to a viral nephropathy. 
causing acute kidney injury. Also, damage associated molecular patterns in the setting of multi organ failure, and particularly in the setting of ARDS with the complex lung kidney crosstalk pathways, may have also been contributing. Another potential etiology is drug toxicity. Many of these patients were on nephrotoxic medications, uh, including antibiotics like vancomycin, amongst others. And lastly, there may be patients who developed rhabdomyolysis, viral induced or otherwise, where the endogenous pigment myoglobin may be contributing to kidney injury. There's also was concern for hypercoagulability and or thrombotic microangiopathy, given that many of these patients had thrombotic events in other organs, particularly the lung. And uh, as we know, the high incidence of elevated D-dimers in many of these se severely ill COVID-19 patients. Lastly, but probably most remotely, uh, was the possibility of a glomerulonephritis, a glomerular disease process leading to acute kidney injury in these patients. Early reports out of China indeed showed that proteinuria and hematuria were poor prognostic factors in patients with kidney injury and COVID-19 disease. So with these potential mechanisms in mind, uh, at the peak of the pandemic, my colleagues and I looked at the kidney findings based on autopsy experience. Clearly during the peak of the pandemic, patients with acute kidney injury and COVID-19 were not getting biopsied, but we hoped that we would be able to glean some useful information from what the autopsy tissue showed. So we accumulated 42 cases of COVID-19 uh, where patients underwent autopsy at Columbia. Um, the median age was 72 and 69% were male. 91% of the patients were non-white, most of which were of Hispanic descent, reflecting the patient population we serve here at Columbia. Uh, I would just caution that these, as a cross-sectional autopsy study, these are not indicative of the overall COVID-19 patient population at Columbia. Nonetheless, I think a lot of the data that we were able to amass uh, still was reflective of underlying pathobiology. In terms of comorbid conditions, 73% of patients had hypertension, diabetes and coronary artery disease, as well as obesity were also common, and 28% of patients had chronic kidney disease. Over the course of their hospitalization, approximately two-thirds of patients were exposed to at least one nephrotoxin, the most common of which was vancomycin, only a small subset of which had any elevated trough levels. These were the sickest of the sick patients and they universally had elevated inflammatory markers and D-dimer levels. Acute kidney injury was present in 94% of the patients who underwent autopsy. 81% had AKI stage two or three, so pretty significant acute kidney injury. 26% required renal replacement therapy. In terms of the baseline characteristics of these kidneys from a pathology standpoint, there wasn't a lot of chronic injury uh, despite the high incidence of comorbid conditions and the advanced age of these patients. Less than 25% glomerular sclerosis was observed in the majority, 80% of patients, and less than 25% tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis also was present in the vast majority, 86%. Vascular disease, this narrowing of the arteries by intimal sclerosis, due to the combined effects of aging and hypertension was common, present in 83%, which is, isn't surprising given the advanced age of these patients. Despite an incidence of 40% of clinical diabetes, evidence of diabetic glomerular sclerosis is demonstrated here by this mesangial expansion by matrix material in a nodular pattern was only observed in 19% of the cases. The most common finding that correlated with acute tubular acute kidney injury in these patients was acute tubular injury. 32% showed mild acute tubular injury based on histologic assessment. This is an example here showing some mild luminal ectasia, some cy cytoplasmic vacuolization, but not much in the way of epithelial simplification. There's still relatively fair amounts of apical cytoplasm, though brush borders are not appreciated in these cases of mild acute tubular injury. Another 19% showed more moderate to severe acute tubular injury. In this particular example, there's again luminal ectasia, slightly more prominent coarse clear intracytoplasmic vacuolization, and also some nuclear enlargement with prominent nuclei containing nucleoli. This is one of the most severe acute tubular injuries observed in our series, 
you could see that there is extensive luminal ectasia with epithelial simplification, loss of brush borders, nuclei touching the apical surface of the cytoplasm, as well as mild diffuse interstitial edema. Perhaps most importantly, the degree of acute tubular injury as graded on histologic assessment was typically mild relative to the clinical degree of acute kidney injury. As you can see from this breakdown here, amongst patients with stage three acute kidney injury, six showed mild histologic acute tubular injury, whereas only three showed moderate to severe changes. Similar findings were observed in the setting of AKI stage two. Other groups looking at autopsy series have reported a similar phenomena with a discordance bet the, between the histologic degree of acute tubular injury and the clinical degree of acute kidney injury. This indicates that the predominant processes are most likely hemodynamic and sepsis related mechanisms, most likely akin to other forms of ICU associated acute tubular injury. It also suggested the potential for favorable renal outcomes in patients who survived their ICU stay with severe COVID-19 disease, given the fact that these were good looking kidneys at baseline with only mild chronic changes and the degree of histologic acute tubular injury was also generally mild. And indeed, this appears to be somewhat vindicated by follow-up studies here at Columbia looking at death and renal recovery after renal replacement therapy. Uh, in a group of 115 patients seen during the pandemic here at Columbia, 41% of patients recovered kidney function, 84% uh, of patients who survived, representing 84% of survivors. What about SARS COVID-19 2 associated microangiopathy? Uh, there were many potential mechanisms where the SARS COVID-2 virus may have interfered with endothelial cell function uh, producing thrombotic phenomena in multiple organs, including the kidney. So there could have been endothelial injury secondary to direct SARS-CoV-2 cytopathic effects on endothelial cells. There could be crosstalk between the complement and coagulation cascade, or there may be cytokine-mediated effects leading to a pattern akin to a, a microangiopathy in the kidney. Indeed, in native biopsies, rare instances of TMA were reported. Uh, there were two cases, one of which had an apparent alternative complement pathway defect, suggesting a potential for a double hit phenomena. And there are rare N of two reports of cortical infarction and imaging in patients with COVID-19 disease. In our autopsy series and other autopsy series, fibrin thrombi were not a predominant finding. Uh, I'm showing you here a fibrin thrombus in one arteriole at the vascular pole of a glomerulus, resulting in congestion of the capillary, and here a muscular artery with a fibrin thrombus. Uh, so these were rare phenomena and never really suspected to be the major cause of AKI, and not really a prominent finding in our autopsy series or others. If you compile all those autopsy series, nine out of 80 autopsy kidneys showed evidence of focal isolated fibrin thrombus formation uh, but again, not suspected to be the predominant cause of acute kidney injury in these patients. And in an autopsy series, it's unclear how much of this is actually related to more of a terminal DIC pathway or DIC in the setting of hepatic dysfunction, as opposed to a, a true thrombotic microangiopathy phenomena. Another potential question was whether SARS-CoV-2 viral nephropathy existed. So did the virus directly infect the kidney? We know that amongst other organs, the kidneys, particularly proximal tubular cells, express ACE2, the cellular entry point of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So there was potential that via COVID viremia, SARS-CoV-2 could enter the kidney, particularly the proximal tubular cells, and potentially elicit a viral nephropathy. An early autopsy series out of China identified potential viral particles in many kidney epithelial cells, particularly the proximal tubule. Um, these round structures within the cytoplasm of these cells had spike-like projections at the periphery, and it was reported that these could potentially represent viral particles. And a New England Journal article early in the pandemic also showed that via PCR and in situ hybridization, very low level viral DNA, RNA, could be detected in multiple cells throughout the body, including the kidney, 
and via insight to hybridization, these cells were shown to be present in multiple cell types, including proximal tubular cells and podocytes. Our group and others via five distinct methodologies have not been able to replicate these findings of viral particles uh, detected by any of these modalities. We've performed immunostains for viral spike and nucleocapsid proteins, uh, both in autopsy and native kidney biopsy specimens that have not been able to identify definitive viral particles. In situ hybridization for viral RNA by automated platform and manual RNA scope has also failed to reveal viral particles. And we've also not been able to identify ultrastructural evidence of definitive viral particles. High magnification examination of kidney cells, particularly the proximal tubular cells, uh, does reveal many structures that may mimic viral particles how, such as clathrin coated pits and other transport vesicles. However, what we were not able to identify is what was seen here in this image from the CDC, where you have a viral particle that's within a membrane bound structure, as opposed to the spikes directly touching the cytosol of the cell, they should generally be bound up within these membrane bound structures to really be indicative of a true viral particle. Uh, and again, we've not been able to identify this either in autopsy or kidney biopsy specimens. So what other things have we encountered in patients with COVID-19? Uh, I think a good jumping off point here would be to take a look at this case, a 62-year-old black male with low-grade fever, hypoxia, acute kidney injury, and nephrotic syndrome. His creatinine was 11.6. Four months before hospitalization, he had a creatinine of one. A spot protein to creatinine ratio was 19 grams, and a serum albumin was 2.4 gram per deciliter. He was SARS-CoV-2 positive, but despite hypoxia, did not require mechanical ventilation. So a kidney biopsy was performed, and on the silver stain sections, what you see is this implosive type wrinkling and thickening of glomerular basement membranes, accompanied by this prominent hypertrophy and hyperplasia of overlying glomerular epithelial cells, many of which contain abundant and prominent intracytoplasmic protein resorption droplets. These lesions are consistent with collapsing variant of FSGS and were accompanied by diffuse and relatively severe acute tubular injury and interstitial edema. So COVID-19 associated collapsing FSGS has become a widely accepted phenomena. Clinically, these are usually male patients and generally of African ancestry. The patients typically have elevated inflammatory markers such as IL-6, but are usually not critically ill, ventilator-dependent ICU uh, care requiring COVID-19 disease. They typically present with AKI and nephrotic syndrome. Their pathology is almost identical to HIV-associated nephropathy. And in fact, other groups have coined the term COVAN, COVID-19-associated nephropathy. It's characterized by collapsing FSGS, accompanied by acute tubular injury and interstitial inflammation, with variable degrees of tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis, not uncommonly showing tubular microcysts akin to those seen in HIV-associated nephropathy. At the ultrastructural level, podocyte foot process effacement tends to be extensive, consistent with a podocytopathy, and in the setting of the elevated interferon levels of active COVID-19 infection, there are not infrequently endothelial tubular reticular inclusions or interferon footprints present within endothelial cells of the glomeruli. Importantly, we and others have not detected evidence of direct viral infection of the kidney by multiple modalities in these patients, including EM, in situ hybridization, and immunohistochemistry for viral associated proteins. There's a two-hit hypothesis for COVID-19-associated collapsing FSGS, and the story is remarkably similar to, similar to HIV-associated nephropathy. The idea is that these patients have high-risk APOL1 genotype uh, in their podocytes. In the setting of an acute podocyte insult, in this case, interferon hit in the setting of COVID-19 disease, there is severe and sudden podocyte injury mediated through APOL1 high-risk genotype leading to a collapsing FSGS uh, image on the biopsy, causing nephrotic syndrome and acute kidney injury. This is a list to date of the cases of collapsing FSGS reported in the setting of COVID-19 by our group and others. 
Um, the outcomes as shown here are generally poor. Many patients remain dialysis dependent or are left with significant residual chronic kidney disease and proteinuria. That said, the follow-up intervals to date are still relatively short. If we use HIVAN as a potential model for what we expect this disease to behave like, uh, we would expect that the outcomes would most likely be poor in the majority of these patients. It still remains unclear to what extent there's a benefit for immunosuppression with corticosteroids and use of drugs such as tocilizumab in these patients. Now that we're kind of out of the woods here in New York from the, uh, the acute pandemic, we are starting to see some attenuated forms of COVID-19 associated collapsing FSGS. This is a biopsy I received in August from a 64-year-old black male who was hospitalized in April of 2020 with COVID-19 disease with his hospital course complicated by acute kidney injury. Uh, at the time of his biopsy in August of 2020, he had a creatinine of 2.8, 2.3 grams of proteinuria and an albumin of 3.5. And while there were no implosive acute collapsing lesions of FSGS, what the biopsy did show was the solidification of the glomerular tuft that had been pulled down towards the vascular pole and it was now capped over by a single layer of epithelial cells. We've seen similar forms of attenuated collapsing FSGS in patients with HIV uh, with previous active viremia, uh, who, but who had controlled disease at the time of biopsy. What's important to note in this biopsy is the extent of severe tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis indicating here that the long-term prognosis of this disease may indeed be very poor. There's also been some descriptions of other glomerular disease in the setting of COVID-19. These include minimal change disease, ANCA-associated glomerulonephritis, anti-GBM nephritis, membranous nephropathy, accelerated lupus nephritis with a crescentic transformation, and in the transplant setting, acute T-cell-mediated rejection, um, my word of caution here would be that the mechanistic link between a lot of these entities and COVID-19 is largely speculative, and this likely just represents a potpourri of diseases that we had seen in the pre-COVID era. Uh, we haven't observed any increased incidence in any of these diseases to date, with the exception of collapsing FSGS due to COVID. So in conclusion, Acute tubular injury is the most common histologic finding in patients with COVID-19 associated AKI in the ICU setting, and the degree of acute tubular injury is generally mild relative to the clinical degree of acute kidney injury, which again suggests that typical ICU etiology such as sepsis and, and hypoperfusion mediated mechanisms may be the major players here, and this, this suggests potential for favorable outcomes in those that do survive. SARS-CoV-2 viral particles have not been convincingly demonstrated in the kidney by uh, us or other large groups in the US. While thrombosis is a feature of COVID-19, thrombosis in the kidney appears to be a focal finding and not contributing to AKI in the vast majority of patients. And lastly, particularly in patients with African ancestry and those presenting with acute kidney injury and nephrotic syndrome, collapsing FSGS appears to have a clear mechanistic link with SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, via APOL1-mediated mechanisms and is an important disease to keep on your radar in these patients. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and please enjoy the rest of the course. Hello, I'm Dr. Jay Coiner from the University of Chicago and today I'll be talking to you about paradigms and AKI recognition using artificial intelligence lessons for future pandemics. Here are my disclosures. I'm gonna start by doing a case presentation. Uh, there's a 49 year old man who presents to your emergency room in the setting of a known COVID positive status. He's been having increasing shortness of breath and fevers and is now experiencing two days of nausea and vomiting in watery stools. He has rhinorrhea and uh, non-productive bloody cough in addition to non-bloody brown watery bowel movements. He's had significant nausea with several episodes of non-bloody non-bilious vomiting and he's continued to take his medications every day. You see he's got a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, some mild CHF. He's obese and has CKD3. He's on a NACE inhibitor, beta blocker, some loop diuretic, and then some medications for, uh, for his diabetes. 
His vitals, uh, he's uh, febrile at 101.7. He's tachycardic. His blood pressure is low at 95 over 70. And he is satting 89% on room air, 97% when placed on four liters nasal cannula. You can see his ABG there. Uh, his BMP is a little bit off. He's got a low bicarbonate, BUN and creatinine ratio that are, are extremely high, BUN of 91, creatinine of uh, 1.7. Uh, his CK, his D-dimer, his lactic acid are all elevated, uh, and his urinalysis in the emergency room shows one plus protein and two plus blood uh, and after a Foley placement. And the question to you is, can we predict the severity of his COVID-related AKI uh, or the need for dialysis using uh, artificial intelligence or AI? Here is a slide showing you the literature that I found when asked to do this talk about how AI can be used to predict COVID AKI. There isn't any. But so uh, I will be talking about uh, how AI can be used in AKI and in critical care risk prediction. Uh, we'll be talking a little with you about phenotyping uh, and then other, uh, 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 other AI tools like decision support tools uh, and uh, end by returning to the case. Right. So uh, loosely defined artificial intelligence is the theory and development of computer systems that are able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, whether that's visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, or even uh, language translation. Right. Depending on who you are and how you think and perhaps uh, what media you consumed as a child, this slide shows a variety of different ways that people think about AI in terms of uh, computers that are interacting with humans and doing human-like things, uh, when in actuality, um, AI is probably more like this, uh, uh, or as I like to explain it, it's sort of everywhere, right? It is uh, in the items we buy in uh, on Amazon.com, in the movies that we consume, or media that we consume. Some of us maybe even have cars that have driverless features. Um, and I actually, rather than the, uh, the movies that were shown on the earlier slides, like to think of it as Minority Report, which is a movie where um, people are given information about the future, but you still have to act on it in order to uh, prevent things from happening. Right? So um, how do we think about uh, how um, AI can be used in nephrology. This is a great review uh, by Azra Bahorak and her colleagues where you talk about all the different information that can be consumed or used um, uh, to help uh, take care of patients, not just with AKI, but with other nephrology issues, or perhaps even with other critical care issues, things related to genetics and microbiome, some of which we'll talk about. It's information that's in uh, a clinical record, whether it's medical records or patient demographics or uh, laboratory values or um, diagnostic testing like ultrasounds uh, or the radiology tests. Um, and finally, uh, bringing in information from the patient themselves, uh, whether it is their reported symptoms, how they're feeling, or uh, um, uh, data that's collected from them in terms of their physical function. And using all of that to uh, improve patient outcomes. Right? There are a wide variety of different types of artificial intelligence. The majority of what we're going to be talking about, at least in the first half of the talk, is machine learning. Uh, I'm not going to go into the different types of supervised versus unsupervised, and I'll touch base on some of the different styles as we go through some of the papers. But rest assured, there isn't just one way um, uh, to make one way to use AI, or one type of AI, I should say. I want to start by talking to you about AI um, as it's been used in risk scores, which is something that um, certainly our case uh, brings to mind, the idea that you can use risk scores to predict who's going to develop AKI. I think most of us are familiar with some of the uh, standardized risk score. This is a data or, or a table from a review that's now 10 years old, summarizing three different risk scores to predict AKI or the need for dialysis after uh, open heart surgery. Um, I like to point out that these are very much static models where you identified a patient's risk before they even went for surgery, not necessarily including uh, values from within the surgery um, uh, or interoperative information. And that's something that we've seen change over the last several years. There have been countless um, reviews and countless other risk scores that can predict um, 
AI in a variety of clinical settings. This is a lovely review by Lou Forney and his team looking at um, several different risk scores to predict ward-based AKI, recognizing that there are lots of scores like the cardiac surgery scores or even things like the Liano score, which have been used to predict ICU-based AKI. But there are lots of scores that are out there. Very few of them have been validated uh, in large-scale um, uh, ex external uh, uh, cohorts, but the idea being that most of these scores, uh, or most of these older scores, are all static, by which I mean they use information um, that is fixed, and that there's been a much greater movement over the last several years to begin to um, use more dynamic modeling, and so some of this comes from um, our increased ability to process information. Um, this is data, again, from Azra Bahorak and her group um, it's a single center retrospective cohort of about uh, 2,900 patients, all of whom uh, went for a major, uh, uh, major surgery, non-cardiac. And what they did was they began to look at the intraoperative vitals in these patients. And you can see the heat maps over here on the left, where they're talking about diastolic blood pressure, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, or MAP. What you can see, red obviously uh, increases the patient's risk for um, uh, AKI and all of those variables are on the x-axis on each uh, y-axis is time so the longer you have a lower map uh, lower map or diastolic pressure or longer you have lower systolic pressures you're in trouble um, or you're at increased risk for AKI and similarly um, there's sort of a, um, a bimodal distribution. Long periods of time with low heart rates or high heart rates increase your risk of AKI. And they quite lovely showed over here, you can see improved model discrimination, increasing the AUC from 0.84 to 0.87 with the inclusion of these interoperative vitals. Right? And they're not the only ones to do this. Uh, this is similar data from another group. Uh, over 42,000 patients this time, really sort of harnessing the power uh, of uh, big data, 10% uh, of whom uh, had AKI. And the same idea here um, that not just uh, sort of a twofold idea here, as you move from uh, left to right, you use sort of a standard log logistic regression model to a random forest, which is one of the AI techniques to a gradient boosted machine model. Um, the idea being that uh, these later models are using decision trees uh, with different variables along the tree uh, to optimize the detection of patients who are at risk for developing uh, AKI or even dialysis after uh, their major non-cardiac non surgery. You can see here that by using these techniques, you're able to boost um, uh, and using perioperative information, they were able to boost the AUC again from the high sevens to the low eights. Right? And these people are not alone in doing this. There are several other risk scores that have been published. This is some lovely data by Fletchett et al. Uh, where they have uh, uh, created and published and even have put online an AKI risk predictor for patients in the ICU. So moving away from the surgical populations. Uh, they originally started by using a, a large scale database um, and developed a risk score in about 2,100 patients and then validated it in another 2,300 where they uh, looked at the development of stage one, stage two, stage three AKI, but they then also looked at the development of those things as the ICU stay got longer, looking at baseline information, admission information, uh, day one, and then information after day one. And they demonstrated quite nicely that adding more information increased your ability to detect those uh, patients and that uh, they were able to increase their AUCs again from the 0.75 uh, to 0.83, even outperforming some of the biomarkers there that are out there on the market um, with their new values. I think the perhaps the most Im uh, impressive part of this is the follow-up paper that they just recently published, where they then took their risk score, put it into practice, and compared it to the performance against real life uh, real life clinicians. Um, right? They asked uh, structured questions to the cl uh, clinical staff for patients without AKI on day zero and day one to figure out who would go on to develop AKI and put it against their machine learning model. And as you can see here, the risk score outperformed the clinicians and their ability to project, predict who was going to develop stage two or stage three. Admittedly, there wasn't a statistical significantly different uh, there wasn't a statistically significant difference between the AUCs, but you can see that the risk score uh, was higher for both uh, 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 both the time of ICU admission as well as day one. Right? The study was certainly limited uh, in that it wound up, uh, while it had 252 patients, only about 30 of them had um, significant a uh, AKI, uh, and scores like this need to be validated in larger 
cohorts are externally validated outside of uh, um, a specific hospital setting. Uh, to that end, I want to talk a little bit about my own work. Um, my group has actually published a couple of different models to try to predict AKI. Uh, this first paper was a ward-based model, which used uh, lo uh, logistic regression, solely looking at patients in the ward. And then we actually used a machine learning gradient-boosted machine model, just like that um, large-scale uh, non-cardiac surgery study I talked to you about before. Um, but recently, within the last year, we've published this paper where we took a modified version of the uh, gradient boosted machine learning score and validated it externally um, in two separate cohorts. Um, so we had developed a, a model that had 140 or so components to it. Um, and then we uh, actually pared it down, recognizing that implementing a model with so many variables would be actually difficult. We pared it down to one with about 40 components um, and then we validated it in two distinct uh, hospital cohorts. I work at the University of Chicago and we validated it in 200,000 admissions from Loyola, which is a tertiary care center in Chicago, and then the North Shore University Health System, um, which is a, a four hospital system in the northern suburbs. And there we had over 240,000 uh, admissions. Importantly, when we did this, um, we uh, excluded patients who didn't have creatinines during their uh, admissions. Um, we ex uh, excluded patients um, excuse me, we excluded patients who had stage two AKI before they hit the wards uh, or the ICU. So people who had interoperative uh, uh, AKI or e, uh, ER-based AKI. Uh, and then we also excluded patients who had a significant CKD at baseline, CKD4, people who received dialysis within the first 48 hours of their hospitalization, and anyone who was admitted with a creatinine greater than three, as we weren't sure whether or not those people had AKI or CKD. Uh, regardless, here is the list of the 40 or so variables that we included in our model, uh, not just patient demographics, but also labs and vitals and some nursing scores that you can see, including many of the components of the clim clinical chemistries, blood counts, liver function tests. Uh, when, when appropriate, we use blood gases or ketones as well, as well as change in some of those labs. So things like your uh, change in pulse uh, or change in uh, blood pressure and change in uh, uh, chemistries as well. Right? And so we built this model using uh, a machine, uh, a machine learning gradient boosted sy uh, system. Um, and you can see here that we had uh, excellent uh, prognostication of who's going to develop AKI within the next 48 hours. You can see that the model uh, predicted in the mid eights for stage two, uh, in the low nines for stage three, and that when you start talking about the receipt of dialysis or kidney replacement therapy, um, three days in advance providing AUC is above 0.9. Right. Similarly, when you begin to look at different sub-cohorts, um, whether patients were on the floor or in the ICU, whether um, they came in with uh, baseline creatinine between one, uh, less than one, greater than, uh, excuse me, a baseline creatinine less than one, uh, one between one and two, or between uh, two and three, you can see excellent discrimination. Similarly, excellent discrimination for surgical and non-surgical patients as well. You may be thinking to yourself, well, that's great. Um, how can we implement uh, a, a score like this? What are the test characteristics? Uh, this is the data specific to the University of Chicago cohort from, uh, from the study. What I'll choose to highlight and you'll see is that we've begun to implement this score in our hospital and using some of these fairly uh, mid-range risk scores. The, uh, the probability cutoffs are essentially meaningless, but if you see on the table here, we're talking about scores that provide sensitivity and specificities uh, above 80% and a positive predictive value somewhere between 24 and 31%, meaning that um, for every alarm, one in four or one in three people are destined to have uh, severe AKI, stage two AKI, and that the negative predictive value of the test is quite high. So if your score uh, is not that high, you're not going to develop AKI. Right. As I mentioned, we had begun and we've begun to use this score uh, and implement it in a variety of clinical trials. This is just a screenshot from uh, a patient where you can see we calculated in real time. And as I mentioned, um, we're using variables and labs. And so that as those things are reported and changed, uh, the, the score can change in real time. Um, and this is just an example from a patient uh, who had a, a congestive heart failure who was actively being diuresed and had um, um, some signs and symptoms of early kidney uh, issues, and then when their creatinine bumped a little bit, you can see that their risk score uh, uh, increased tremendously, in part uh, because of other changes in the laboratories and changes in the vitals that had happened as well.
right? And this is not to say that my group is the only group doing this. Many of you have probably seen that in the last two years uh, in combination with the VA system, uh, Google set out to do the same thing and they provided similar AUCs here from uh, their study. They used a much more complicated model with over 700 features, harnessing the entire power of the electronic medical record uh, to predict AKI quite accurately. You can see AUCs uh, above 90 uh, for any stage of AKI uh, and even higher when you start looking at stage two or stage three. And so that um, whether um, uh, you, you, whether uh, the folks from Google are able to externally validate their score uh, or uh, our score or some of the other scores that are out there, I think that eventually we're all going to see more and more scores in our electronic medical records, right? And so to sort of summarize this little section here, uh, several models have been uh, built and shown. They all generally perform quite well. I think the next step is not just, um, while some of them have been externally validated and some have used large, large cohorts like the Veterans Administration uh, to be built, we need to actually figure out whether or not these uh, scores actually can impact and improve in, improve care, and that um, the only way to do this is to prospectively validate them and to use them. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that work in a couple of minutes, right? Um, in addition to those risk scores, I think that there's also been some recent work to look at AKI phenotypes. Um, this is a paper and we'll talk a little bit about why that uh, might be needed before we delve into this paper. I think the idea is that we've gotten so used to thinking about all AKI in the setting of, say, sepsis being the same, but it's entirely possible that patients who have um, sepsis and AKI, some may have nephrotoxic-associated uh, AKI. And then within sepsis AKI, there may be different flavors of AKI, some people with a more inflammatory response, some people with a more... Um, ischemic response, some people with um, microvascular dysfunction, and that recently in a paper that's uh, slated to come out um, this month in C. Jason, the, a group from Mount Sinai uh, used the uh, MIMIC3 database, which is a Boston hospital um, uh, database for ICU patients that is uh, openly available to identify three distinct phenotypes of patients, um, all of whom developed AKI in the setting of sepsis within the first 48 hours of uh, ICU stays. And what you can see here in their map is that um, using some of the same variables that you saw uh, in some of the uh, other risk scores, using demographics, vitals, laboratory tests, they were able to sort of tease out three distinct groups in what was uh, originally thought to be one large group of several thousand patients who had uh, sepsis-associated AKI. Uh, and this group is not the first to do it. Uh, also within the past couple of years, uh, Bat Raju and colleagues have used latent class analysis uh, to identify AKI phenotypes in a separate cohort uh, of patients who had sepsis uh, or, or sepsis-associated AKI. Um, they divided patients from the VAST trial. Remember that this is a trial seeking to look at vasopressin in the setting of sepsis, uh, in the setting of sepsis uh, or septic shock. Um, they divided the cohort into a discovery and validation cohort, and then you can see here on the slide that they looked at a variety of clinical factors, whether those be biomarkers uh, or um, need for me mechanical ventilation or um, laboratory tests. They were able to develop two distinct phenotypes of patients who had sepsis-associated AKI from the study and that they were actually able to identify and improve the identification of these people by adding some of the biomarkers, things like angiopoietin 1 and 2 and IL-8 levels in order to identify sort of two distinct groups of people from the study who wound up having different outcomes. The idea being that one of the groups was more likely to uh, have uh, renal recovery and improve survival than the other. Um, in fact, they took it a step further and followed it up, recognizing that uh, there were not just differences in the ANG2 levels, but that when they did genetic analysis, uh, that the patients actually had uh, different um, mutations within their ANG2 gene, which correlated to uh, increased or decreased levels depending on which phenotype they were. And so I, I cite this as an example that you can see um, within a group of people who were thought to have sepsis AKI, there may actually be ways to sort of push through all of the um, 
the myriad of data that we're bombarded with to actually find two distinct groups and figure out patients who may actually uh, be better uh, or more likely to respond um, to a treatment, as was the case here, recognizing that uh, patients were more likely to, ha um, uh, one of the phenotypes is more likely to have a better response to the vasopressin, uh, which again, remember, was uh, part of the trial that they were in, and that you can imagine in the future, uh, we're going to be able to unravel um, not just sepsis AKI, uh, but cardiac surgery associated AKI, um, or other flavors of AKI to try to identify patients who are more likely to respond to one treatment or another, or may benefit uh, uh, from one course of action or another. Right, and so that leads me to uh, the last part of the, uh, of the talk where we'll be talking about clinical decision support, uh, right? This is actually the implementation of some of uh, the AI techniques that we've talked about. And sort of uh, plainly speaking, clinical decision support is linking your healthcare observations with the uh, knowledge to, uh, to influence the health choices by clinicians to improve patient care, right? And on the simplest level, it can be uh, something like this, which is uh, quite elegant work by John Callum and his group, where they used a uh, clinical decision support tool that uh, a, derived a reference creatinine from historical values within the medical record, uh, and then B, automatically flagged patients who had KDGO-based AKI, um, right? Uh, and then they demonstrated that after implementing this, they were actually able to show a small but sustained decrease in hospital mortality, length of stay, and use of dialysis in their population across their, um, their hospital. So just by training the computer to identify uh, what the normal baseline creatinine for a patient is, which is not always easy to do, and then flagging it when patients had AKI, they were able to improve patient outcomes, um, right? Uh, no detailed intervention outside of that, no plan of care, um, no do this for patients with AKI. So you can imagine how if we take it a step further, uh, there may be some improvement. I guess I would point out that um, they the same group just recently showed that as they've extended out their uh, decision support tool, they've continued to improve patient outcomes with uh, slow and steady decreases um, in mortality and length of stay. This is pa a paper that was just published um, earlier this year. But you can imagine a world where when you link that same um, acknowledgement that the patient has AKI to a series of care plans or uh, educational um, system-wide bundles that you may be able to improve patient outcomes. And that's exactly what Nick Selby and his group uh, and others in uh, uh, England have done in this uh, multi-center step wedge cluster randomized trial, um, where over five hospitals and uh, over 24,000 AKI episodes, uh, they did exactly that. They um, had uh, decision support that allowed for um, a variety of tools to help improve patient care and that they were able to um, improve the delivery of AKI care, reduce hospital stay. They did not impact the AKI progression or 30-day uh, mortality, unfortunately. And you can see that uh, as they did this, right, um, there was improved recognition of AKI, uh, improved fluid assessment, so figuring out the patient's volume status, no change in the number of nephrology consults that were in place, no change in the number of catheters, um, uh, more urinalysis, more medication review, and more care bundle usage was done. And again, no, also no change in uh, renal ultrasound. So just by thinking about why the patient has AKI, doing volume assessment and medication review, they were able to improve patient care. Um, uh, at the same time that Nick Selby's group was doing that, this is uh, the ICE trial from uh, Lou Forney and his group, which was a two-hospital before and after uh, uh, study, where in one hospital, they intervened with not just a risk score, but then also a care bundle, and the other hospital uh, was sort of a sham uh, pr procedure where they just continued uh, without any intervention. You can see here that they implemented a risk score um, that was fairly simple based on age, respiratory rate, nursing assessment scores, and then the presence of uh, diabetes, hypertension, CKD, or liver disease. Um, they then, uh, for patients who were at risk but didn't have AKI, they did many of the same things that uh, we talked about from the Selby study, assess the fluid status, review the medications, um, look at the urine, and then for patients who had AKI, there was a much more intensive uh, protocol. Again, all of this being tri uh, triggered by computer decision support. Um, they were able to demonstrate at the intervention site that there was a clear decrease in inpatient mortality, both in the uh, overall, but also in seven days. Um, there was no difference in stage 
3 AKI or no difference in the peak rise in creatinine or length of stay. And then perhaps more importantly, um, when you compared across sites, there were differences in those overall mortalities across the two hospitals. Um, these are not the only trials. Um, uh, both of those trials were done in England, in the United States. Stu Goldstein uh, and uh, his team have done quite a bit of work using computer deci or, uh, clinical decision support, excuse me, to prevent AKI uh, from nephrotoxins um, using the NINJA protocol, the nephrotoxic injury negated by just-in-time action. Uh, you can see here um, that uh, they used uh, the EHR-based plan to look and prevent high-risk patients from being exposed. Um, and so they describe here then uh, high-risk exposure is a patient receiving three or more nephrotoxic agents or one getting an aminoglycoside for at least three or more days. Um, and what they originally demonstrated was the idea that um, there were several medications uh, that were uh, causing or associated with an, a predominance of some of the episodes of AKI. Um, and they wanted to figure out a way to prevent um, those exposures uh, from happening. Um, and so they implemented this protocol where for those high-risk patients, uh, they began to do two things. One began to check creatinines more regularly, and two, when people went to prescribe nephrotoxic agents, um, they were alerted that their patient was high risk and perhaps there should have been alternatives for that. And they were originally in a single center study here published in 2016, able to demonstrate uh, a sustained decrease in AKI rates. Uh, and again, this is for non-ICU patients. Uh, you can see uh, the, the decrease over time uh, from here down to here. Um, and that when they uh, summed it all up, you can see that they wound up avoiding over that uh, period of time uh, over 600 exposures um, and potentially avoided over 400 episodes of AKI um, just from alerting people that, hey, your patient is high risk, you should be checking creatinines, you should be avoiding ordering these other medications. And then recently within the last year or so, uh, they've actually begun to um, or they actually published data from a multi-center trial and uh, in nine centers, again, non-ICU patients, they were able to show a sustained decrease of about 24% in terms of uh, nephrotoxic AKI, right? Uh, this is data from Perry Wilson and his group where they have implemented a separate risk score uh, uh, that you can see. It's a complicated uh, equation, but again, based on patient demographics and lab values, and they actually used it to serve as a trigger to check biomarkers in patients who are at high risk. And they actually demonstrated quite nicely um, that the patients who then went on to develop AKI actually had higher biomarkers uh, uh, in some settings um, compared to others. And uh, this is the sort of prospective validation of some of the risk scores that I was talking about that I think that we need to see in order to make sure that they're actually making a difference. Can you pair a risk score with biomarker measurements to find a very high risk patient um, who is uh, at risk for adverse outcomes? Right, um, and so to conclude, uh, clinical decision support use uh, can vary from just alerting to f physicians that AKI may be present um, to uh, several forms of uh, CSD uh, that I talked about, which have improved patient outcomes like patient mortality. I think that, as I mentioned before, they need to be prospectively validated um, in order to make sure that the tools do what they're supposed to do and actually improve patient care. But what does all this mean for COVID AKI, right? I can imagine a world where in the future, uh, we have a system that identifies patients who have abnormal uh, inflammatory labs um, and it flags them being at high risk for AKI, perhaps offering drug dosing guidance or reducing nephrotoxin exposures, or even um, uh, recommending that they get specific antivirals or uh, providing you with guidance around how to do their volume assessment or diuretic management. Um, right? Uh, hopefully it doesn't come to that, um, but I think that uh, this is where we are headed um, and that we should all um, uh, be willing to embrace uh, artificial intelligence um, as I think that it can help, if validated, it can help to improve our AKI care. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And that concludes this session organized by AKI Now on promoting excellence in the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 related AKI. And just a few summary and conclusions. I think it's safe to say that COVID-19 has dramatically affected all of us and virtually all aspects of our lives and has certainly dramatically affected the patient and caregiver experience. And it's interesting to sort of think that there's been negative and maybe some positive effects.
Certainly the use of PPE in patient isolation has been a challenge and the restriction on vi visitors has been hard for our patients. But then there's been improved use of multidisciplinary teams and collaborations and the rapid development, sharing, and use of new knowledge. We know that kidney involvement in COVID-19 is more common than initially thought and is associated with morbidity and mortality and rates vary substantially among studies and regions. The pathophysiology is probably multifactorial and many features are shared between COVID-19 AKI and AKI from other causes in the ICU. And many of the treatments and preventative measures are similar to AKI outside of COVID-19. Considerations for renal replacement therapy are similar to other causes of AKI, except there is a need for more aggressive anticoagulation and treatments may need to be adjusted to conserve resources. The role of extracorporeal blood purification therapies remains to be determined. The burden of AKI really is substantial in a large series occurring in 17% of patients, 77% with severe COVID-19 disease, and a substantial increase in mortality with an odds ratio of 15 and a 52% mortality. Acute tubular injury is the most common pathologic finding, and this is generally mild relative to the severity of clinical AKI by stage, which may indicate that hemodynamic and sepsis-related mechanisms are important, and may also indicate favorable renal outcomes for survivors. Collapsing FSGS with AKI and nephrotic syndrome is an important COVID-19-related cause of kidney disease to keep on your radar. Artificial intelligence has great potential to improve prediction, recognition, and outcomes of AKI in COVID-19 disease and otherwise, especially with real-time dynamic modeling. AI may be useful to identify phenotypes of AKI, and AI is useful for, for clinical decision support in AKI, and a number of published studies have demonstrated improved care and outcomes with this approach. Finally, thank you to Dr. Serta and the AKI Now initiative for organizing this session. And again, to all the wonderful speakers who participated in putting this session together.